Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to our last uh, series of uh, plenary sessions. So the first session is uh, the first talk is given by Professor David Hill. That needs no introduction. One of the leading experts in, in power systems and one of the few people I know that understands both control and power systems. So he's always requested by both communities. I guess you have the busy schedule in the world. And he will be talking about power network science, stability, and control. Thank you, Rumea. Um, let me just figure out how do I forward here. Yeah. Uh, okay, great. Um, well, uh, where's Sasha? Is he? Is I just want to acknowledge um, when Sasha contacted me about giving a, a plenary at the first Mignon. I, it took me about one millisecond to agree, uh, without really even knowing what I was going to talk about. Um, first of all, I hadn't been back to St. Petersburg. I, I came here about three, three years in a row in the early 90s and I just really wanted the opportunity to come back and, and see the city. And of course, a nominee control conference, that's a new one, that's special. Um, but then I thought about what I could talk about and the, it, I knew I was going to have a room full of experts in stability and control. But there's a story that's perhaps less familiar to the control community relating to power networks. And it certainly relates very strongly to my own experiences within Russia. Um, I think I said the other day at the memorial session that I came here as a kind of fact-finding mission in the areas of control, and I met Zipkin and Yakubovich and so on. But I also did a, a, a big tour of the big power institutes. And to sort of set the scene, I should remind you of a famous quote, which I probably don't get perfectly, but Lenin is supposed to have said that communism equals electrification plus Soviets. To give you an idea, and now correct me if I'm wrong, Russian people, but uh, it, um, the power systems, the establishment of a power grid in the early days of Soviet Russia was a major piece of nation building. And uh, senior scientists got involved, and they were very powerful figures. And I'll say a little bit more about that history. But that's my background. I, I came here, and I learned an incredible amount um, about a very scientific tradition. Hence, the, the, uh, I'm writing a book about this now. I give two graduate courses about it in Hong Kong, and I'm going to do the whole story in 40 minutes. So it's obviously going to be a very general talk. But, I just wanted to put the word science in there because uh, in mostly people talk about power systems as either a very practical engineering discipline or as a playground for control theorists and communication theorists and so on. The point I want to get across is that I feel that the study of these difficult nonlinear networks is a very interesting scientific discipline and I claim that that thinking started here in Russia in the 1930s. Okay, so I'm going to run through modelling, which I guess relates to the idea of system identification in this conference, stability control and conclusions. Um, the first point is a rather obvious one. You only have to look at the power grids of China, connected Europe, and the USA to agree with comments like power, power grids are amongst the most complex systems ever built. By complex, I'll have a, a mathematical description of that soon. And this is the first slide that I show to my graduate students who tend to come from diverse backgrounds, but they're all going to work in, or well, mostly they're going to work in power systems. And it's the idea that a, a power grid is one big machine and we consider it on many time scales from actually microseconds, nanoseconds, out to hours and days. But for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to be talking about angles between generators. There's a synchronism problem. I'm going to be talking about the velocities, their frequencies, and uh, voltages. A key thing to appreciate is that the only system variable here is frequency. The angles reflect power flows in the grid, and the voltages reflect something that electrical engineers know all about, which is reactive power. 
These distinctions or these subtleties in the dynamics cause people who come from other subjects a lot of grief because they want to apply theorems which talk about equilibria of, of, of a kind that they know mathematically and they often have trouble translating this behaviour into their, their pet topic. But on a, you have short-term issue of synchronism, um, a, um, a, a somewhat short-term issue of frequency offset and then they have integral control to get rid of that. But things can come back later on in the form of self-excited oscillations. Meanwhile, the voltages can get, go through short-term dips you can think the whole game is, uh, is all good, and then later on you can either get medium term or long term voltage collapses. And if I had hours, I could tell you about examples of these things uh, all over your own, uh, probably all over your own networks. But the point is it's one big machine, angles, system variable frequency, and voltages. They all have dynamics. And people, um, okay, this is a common picture of what can go wrong. People living in Northeast USA know all about that. They were probably there. The, um, these problems sometimes cascade, and when they cascade uh, rather completely, you can get major blackouts. So the idea is to nip something like this in the, in the early stages. The problem started over here, and it cascades across. Uh, USA, Canada, because they didn't know what to do when the problem was localised. Okay, um, due to the efforts of some analytically minded people, such as myself, arguing with engineers, a lot of the stability concepts have been codified in this IEEE paper. And, and it took years. Um, we had, but it's finally been expressed in terms of the up and off concepts and so on. So that, you might argue that there's a, a, a good definitions, but the problem is that the, pro the, the issue is the problems keep changing. So even the definitions in this paper now are somewhat out of date. Okay, let me tell you some history. And I'll better be quick. I claim scientific thinking about power systems started in the early Russian schools. Um, and I, don't, I forget some issue, but I think guys like Goryev, if those of you who know about Parkes equations in Russia, it's Goryev equations. And he was the first person to formulate an energy function, that's a term uh, that the Arpanov functions often get, system dynamics, and then successors, Venikov, who I'll mention later, in Moscow Power Institute, um, had um, concepts of voltage stability way before anyone in the West thought about these, these things. Um, they were very powerful figures, as I mentioned. There's stories like, I think Goryev, I think it was Goryev who ended up in a Stalin jail, but because he was, probably because he was so important to the electrification of Russia, he, he managed to uh, continue um, his, uh, his work. Anyway, some 20 years later, people in the West, Magnuson, in, he was in, um, uh, Oregon, I think, somewhere, that, that, not British Columbia, maybe. Um, he saw Goryev's paper, I believe, and did a multi-variable version. So there was a whole run of work on Lyapunov methods, and Popov's criteria got in there to extend the, um, the validity, and, and Western people, including Jan Willems' brother, Jacques Willems, wrote some very significant papers in this uh, subject. Um, in California, there were some isolated contributions just in basic power flow through. For some reason, Californians like to study power flow, and it's happening again today. Um, but one of my favorite examples comes from a paper by Corsac. Um, I'll, I'll mention that later. Then, in the 1980s, there was a program in, in the US, Systems Engineering for Power, led by Les Fink, and I was a postdoc working in the group of Felix Wu and Prabhupada Wright. But there were groups all over the US, MIT people, Boston people, Washington people, and a whole lot of other techniques came in. Differential geometry, various stability theory. Uh, one part of this program was called the Arpanov's Last Stand, and control theorists got involved. Then the money disappeared, I guess, and some people went 
their, back to their old problems, but um, there was a, 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 there started to be some voltage collapses. And um, some of us from this program hung on and we, we uh, were involved in this uh, area. And in, in that case, it was mainly bifurcation analysis. That was the key mathematical tool. Now, engineers didn't like so much this, but I had the good fortune to be in Sweden as a guest, of, uh, guest professor with Carl Johan Ostrom, whose imagination we all know, and, he's, and, and the engineers that he worked with just said, David, tell us about bifurcations, go for it. So that was a, a great opportunity with Johan Andersen to develop theory there. Most recently, there's a kind of revival, I might call it a revival. For want of a better term, it comes under the umbrella smart grids, which is a term I hate, because most people talking about smart grids don't actually have any, I mean, it, it's, they're either talking about good serious science, which is not much to do with what uh, engineers talk about as smart grids, or it's, it's pretty um, um, unscientific. So I don't, I suspect Romeo, you're not motivated by smart grids, but Romeo is, um, has a lot, I think, of integrity for bringing control ideas to real physical models, or the Lagrange, whatever. So it's just natural that you would pick up power electronics and power systems and with some new Lyapunov ideas. There's a whole lot of guys have come in from the network science area, very good physicists like Motta. Dorf was a, a student who picked up on some things, but he's uh, got a quick name for himself. And they're bringing the idea of the network structure, network science to it all. Then in California, between Caltech, Berkeley, now Stanford, I believe, uh, see it, is that, and uh, the student in LeMay in, in Columbia, and, and Stephen Lowe, there's a whole lot of activity on convexity of the power flow, kind of going back to this, uh, this early work. And then there's a, a control theory aspect. Um, uh, Carly Johansson in Stockholm and his students have some nice work on distributed control, and I guess Stephen Lowe should be added there as well. So a quick run through, this is what I mean by power network science. Half of it, you would go to practical power engineers and they wouldn't be interested. But there's a lot of good science in there. And for me, that's still good enough. Okay, what do we need with power systems control? With this one big uh, machine idea, we have a succession of problems to solve, um, more or less in parallel. There's the balancing problem. A power system, think of, thinking of a car, we, we get a car from A to B thinking about distance, speed, and acceleration. The acceleration is often needed to solve problems. Exactly the same for power systems. We need to talk about energy, power, and ramping, and with lots of renewable power, the ramping aspect is much more important. There's a stability problem. It's a big dynamic beast. It's got to be stable in all the ways that I mentioned before. There's a whole raft of control problems of the regulation kind. Voltages and frequency are only at their nominal values by control. And then we must recover from emergencies. Power systems are subject to nature, faults, um, and uh, we're particularly concerned with how they quickly recover after uh, emergencies. So I'm going to use all these terms. The things that are, have, what, which drive my interest in the uh, subject again are all things that we hear about. Um, generation is becoming more random. Um, now if we had random generation and we want power balance, the, uh, the only solution is really to have load control or storage. Now people talk about these things in very unscientific ways, but I claim there are very there are very good scientific problems here. So this is what all gets talked about, electric vehicles, random generation and so on, and then there's a, in a contextual issue of how do we design the grid. The way they designed grids from the early days of grids was with controllable 
generation. But when you have generation like this, how you design the best grid is another story. The point for an audience like this is that all those analytical problems now have new versions which should interest nonlinear control people. That was one thing that struck me when I came here to Russia was in the West there was all this distinction between linear control and nonlinear control. It seemed here that everything was nonlinear control, especially in power systems. They had amazing um, algorithms for using the Arpanov theory to do switching control in power grids that was unlike anything you would see in the, in the West. Okay, people talk a lot about what future grids might look like and um, it's one, one proposal is somewhat like this or many proposals take something like this form where we'll continue to have some kind of core grid but we just can't keep expanding that the way we have been in the past and then you'll have all these semi-independent clusters who may help each other out, connect to the core grid, and, and I won't deal with this aspect. It's a contextual thing for what I'm going to talk about. But I am interested in it, how you... It, it tends to boil down to a massive optimization problem, to a um, stochastic optimization problem. All right, modeling. Power systems tick all the boxes of complexity. They're highly nonlinear, they're highly connected. The connectivity is granular. Okay? You, you go from high voltage to your household, you go from gigawatts to kilowatts. Now that's a massive scale. And it, the scale is not only in the power level, but it's, all, it's also in the scale of the number of things involved. And there's increasing amounts of um, unpredictability and or uncertainty, and you're always using a mix of discrete and continuous control actions. So pretty well everything um, that you can think of in terms of complexity. Just to, to give you a, the nonlinearity idea, if, if you take the simplest possible situation of a single load bus on a grid, um, undergraduate power flow calculation. These, this is this is the power flow. It's it's highly nonlinear. You're solving for given power flows. You give it for given load powers. You've got to solve for voltages. So it's highly nonlinear. And if we take a very simple example, three buses and a load. Um, uh, as an illustration of a more general network, those power flow equations take this form, which I'm sure most of you have seen. Highly nonlinear equations involving the voltage magnitudes, phase angles, phase angles between the buses reflect the flow on lines. And I'm not going to go into any details, but this is a kind of projection of a power flow solution. Depending on the power that you choose, you might get no solutions, you might get two solutions, or you might get many solutions. And the study of those power flow equations is one where a lot of mathematics has been um, thrown at. Uh, algebraic geometry, differential geometry, you, you name it. Because people want techniques for counting the number of solutions and whether they're stable and so on. Something that's much less appreciated is the role of the graph. And that's why I like this paper going back to 1972. Corsac just shows, and this, this example is motivated by a Western US system, that in a very simple system, you can have two stable solutions. And it really relates to the structure of the graph. It's not so, obviously, Nonlinearities can give you multiple solutions, but this is a statement that the structure of the graph can contribute to multiple solutions. So just even in static power flow, we've got some very interesting questions, and this one hasn't been explored very, very much. Okay, that complicated um, big machine, in order to analyze it, we play divide and conquer. So we typically break the problem up into a phase synchronization problem. This is good, this is bad. For synchronization consensus addicts, it's obviously not exact synchronization because we must have steady state angles which are non-zero. So you might call it bounded synchronization, partial synchronization, different terms. 
This is bad because the generators are heading off in different directions and the network will split. Then another problem is, this is frequency, is self-excited oscillations, Hopf bifurcations, that kind of subcritical, supercritical, that kind of thing. Oops, and I think I'll come to the other one later. Okay. Most people who try to do some research on this, in this area, um, that, that are not within the area, leap on a model which I'd like to tell you all is a very bad model. Um, th if this is the four bus system, two generators, two loads, the so-called classic model for a power system is to take this um, and do what's called cron reduction. So you end up with a model which uh, is, represents the internal voltage of the two generators and a collapsed network connecting those two voltages. And I hear people talking about that graph as the structure of the system and so on. And it's, 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 I won't say it's nonsense, but it's quite wrong. This is not the structure of the system. This is the structure of the system, which has been reduced. Not only that, if this network is lossless, which is a very good assumption for a high voltage grid, this network is lossy. And the reason it's lossy is because of the two loads. And in the early days of the Arpanov theory of power systems, people with, uh, proved all sorts of results for this system, making assumptions like, oh, we can just ignore the, the line loss, which was effectively saying we're ignoring the loads on the system. And if you have no loads on the system, there's no point in having the system itself. So well, we, well, let's call this the network reduction model. Okay. Now my introduction to this topic was to, to look at the mathematics of this system and say that's too hard. Um, if all those guys made so many mistakes, let's find another way to do it. But anyway, so this is the model mathematically. It's a second order differential equation. Angles, frequency, voltages appear here. And here are the, these GIJ terms, the so-called transfer conductances, which relates to the loads on the network. What, um, and then we like to formulate this. Uh, in this audience, I can just take a shortcut. We formulate it as a Luray problem, okay? Linear part, nonlinear part, and then you apply the whole repertoire of stability analysis. First integrals all the way through to pop off. There are hundreds of pages of calculations because it's complicated line integrals and so on. I thought I would spare you any of this because absolutely none of, none of it would surprise you. And I tend to regard most of it as wrong because they make, often make this assumption, GIJ is zero, which I said relates to the loads on the network. So this problem is a major impasse in the area and um, the source of many wrong results. The, it, it boils down to the fact that if you look at the nonlinearity with the GIJ there, it, it's the nonlinearity is not curl free. Um, the potential functions become line path dependent, and that means you need to know the trajectory of the system to solve them. If you need to know the trajectory of the system, there's no point doing stability analysis. So that paradox was broken just by people assuming this away. All right, but there was actually an easy fix. Um, without any thoughts of later, uh, later work, um, my colleague Art Bergen and I, who uh, passed away recently in Berkeley, um, we just decided the whole problem related to this network reduction, cron reduction, so we didn't do it. We made a specific model for the loads, and the Lyapunov function was a trivial calculation. So that, and this this is the model, and uh, I thought that was that was just a trick to get a Lyapunov function. But as it turns out, people are now using this model quite frequently these days because this equation, which we thought of as a load equation is now seen as a nice simple equation for a renewable generator. 
a renewable generator is disconnected from the grid in terms of inertia. So we actually can now use this equation for two things, loads and renewable power. There's no GIJ problem. The up and off functions are well defined and um, you can do all sorts of things with that, that model. Okay, um, so yeah, well-defined Lyapunov functions, and not only that, the Lyapunov functions, the terms in the Lyapunov function relate to the real network, not this collapsed network. I'll say more about stability later. But we actually thought that model was not good enough because we were also interested in voltage behavior, which during transients in a power grid, voltage, as you remember that first slide, uh, dip, and that can have a big influence on synchronizing talks. So the model that I arrived at, the, the, the best model we arrived at, and that was with student Ian Hiskins, Ian is now a professor in Michigan, um, was this. And it, it, it's the same thing, except just tidied up a bit in terms of bookkeeping the variables, uh, frequent angles, frequencies, and we have the power flow equations included which meant that we had to study the stability of differential algebraic systems and um, in a diversion with even Marils, we studied Lyapunov theory for these classes of um, equations. But the, the, the important thing here was the, the load models. And this problem of getting a rigorous Lyapunov function hit another wall. It's a much lower wall than the previous one but it turns out, for reasons I still don't fully understand, we can have a fully dependent reactive power load in this model, but we cannot have a voltage dependent power load, real power load. In order to get a rigorously up and off function, this has to be fixed. Fortunately, power electronics and so on make power loads more like that than, but still theoretically that is a problem I would like to see solved one day. Okay, this is we're still talking about modeling. Um, now let's come to this behavior. If the Swedes in the room and they're old enough, in 1983, this happened in Sweden. And that's a very bad day for a power grid because the frequency was fine, there were no stability issues, and then you, they got a cascading event and something like, I think it was 11 gigawatts out of 18 blacked out. Because of this, Carl Astrom set up a guest professorship in, in, um, in Lund, and I went there, and that's when I first met Carol of Thank you for a, for a start. No, 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 I had already left. 86? You hadn't left then. Okay, let's, let's figure that out later. Um, Anyway, it was a fabulous opportunity to study a problem where I went to talk to engineers. I'm, you know, I'm an analyst, so I'm looking for a, a mathematical model. This, it, in the case of the angle stability, we had a model, you can see it was wrong, we changed it and got a solution. In this case, I had no idea what the model was because the prevailing way of approaching this problem was just to treat it as a power flow problem. A static problem. Now this axis here is time, so I took the view that that has to be dynamic. But what the dynamics are, we don't know. Anyway, so we, I talked to engineers and got some ideas. And in the absence, you know, this the loads on a power grid are not one physical device; they're millions of physical devices aggregated. And um, I guess I was in Newcastle where we had people studying system identification, like Graham at the front here, and I just took the view, if you, if you don't have a physical model, let's just get a black box model. Something that behaves similar to the aggregate behavior. So we came up with a, or a nonlinear differential equation, which would help us solve this problem, and we had to formulate a complete analytical framework um, for having voltages at the right level, equilibrium points at the kind of counterpart to the angle stability problem. I skipped over a lot of details with angle stability because I think none of it would surprise you that much, but voltage stability is, I think, much, uh, 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 should I say, original. 
So the multiple textbooks used to draw these curves of voltage versus power, and they would just say things like the low voltage solution is some kind of mathematical oddity, it doesn't make any sense, and so on. Um, but we, we, want, we didn't believe that, so we pre presented a framework which allowed for voltage level. Um, we needed to know distance to bifurcation points, and we needed to know stability. So that involved quite a lot of uh, thought. But anyway, from a modeling point of view, we came up with generic models, and there was a few other people involved in that, um, that development as well. And we were pleased to see that in the case of particular physical devices, we could show that they fitted into this, but we could also use that model to identify high voltage behavior. And we actually did system tests in Sweden to, to check that. Okay, so for analysts, once again, we're led, now this is, remember the model I showed you for the generator end of the system, this dynamic differential algebraic equation, which looks a little bit messy, but it's just transformer dynamics, load dynamics, and power flow. This is the dynamics that should be used when you're studying voltage behavior on a system. You shouldn't use swing equations, which I see lots of people doing. Um, I get papers to review voltage stability of and I see swing equation. Guys, you're looking at the wrong dynamics. It's, it's really the load dynamics, the behavior on the network, which is the primary cause of those collapses. Generators can be involved, but they're not the primary thing. Anyway, the interesting thing is here, that the stability analysis is once again differential algebraic equations, but totally the only thing in common with the previous model is the power flow. Okay, okay, now just new, but nothing stays still. So now I could argue that both of these models are obsolete. The reason being that this here, which is just called a load in those earlier dynamics, that's where all the action is happening in power grids right now. Distributed generation, so-called demand response, storage. How do we expand the models that we have in order to include all those new control activities? Um, so that's research questions right now. The, 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 my sort of take on it is we used to just think in terms of what was in the green box, you know, the high voltage generators, and we'd lump everything below into that one power. Now, down here, we've got demand response. If you know about these things, distributed generation, a whole lot of distributed control being talked about. So the question is how to, to include that. And we're looking now at things like what I call granulated networks, where the clusters have their own grid, you have grids within grids kind of idea, and there's plenty of opportunities for mathematics to help out there, particularly graph theory. All right, which introduces a theme that is kind of new in power grids, and that is a whole lot of people from network science have come into the area, mainly physicists. They, the subject of network science itself um, has taken hold in physics as the basis of a lot of physics and biology, and they see power grids, it's, it's a big connected network, we can use these ideas. Most of it involves models that power people wouldn't accept, but it does involve a lot of useful, a lot of interesting ideas. And I just, and they have some interesting concepts of fragility and robustness and resilience and so on, which, um, uh, are, are causing some new research. But I just mentioned that in passing. Okay, stability. The stability questions are fourfold. The first one is to solve the dynamic power flow equations, and I skip over what that means. Dynamic power flow equations for given node powers, and that establishes equilibrium. These are nonlinear equations, and things like optimization, convexity, um, structure of graphs all come into play here. And then the second problem is angle stability, or commonly called transient stability. And this is where we use Lyapunov uh, theory. The third problem is to study the damping of the system, 
and there are linear and nonlinear phenomena there, and if you want to get into the nonlinear phenomena, you have to study bifurcation theory. The fourth problem is volt instability, and that is studied in terms of local and global bifurcations. Obviously, I can't tell you too much about all that, but I'll just hint at some of it. Okay. Hundreds of papers study the problem of um, establishing a region of attraction for the equilibrium. Okay? We can't get it exactly. The exact specification, the exact description is involves um, stable and unstable manifolds. If you solve the power flow, you get a range of equilibria, some stable, some unstable. And you can connect these up with stable and unstable manifolds. People at Berkeley, Cao Dong Chiang in particular, he went over and studied uh, Steve Smale and Mo Herschel, a whole bunch of them did actually, really studied all that stuff carefully and made a whole lot of theory summarised in Cao Dong's recent book, um, if you want to see that. But from a practical point of view, what you want to do is get a good approximation that you can compute quickly, and then that helps you calculate things like critical clearing times. The, um, when there's a fault, you clear it with circuit breakers and you want to reclose. The sooner you reclose, the better. And that critical clearing time needs to be computed by looking at the fault on trajectory relative to the stability boundary and making sure you close the circuit breaker before you hit the stability boundary. Hundreds and hundreds of papers written about that problem. Uh, and a quite extensive theory. A lot of it's a bit ad hoc because the energy functions they use um, have to be based on approximations. But that, that, that is a, a huge topic and many books written about it. But this is the unsolved problem. Um, rigorously up and off functions. We, we, we could establish that there were rigorously up and off functions, but we hit a wall with the load models. We could have arbitrary um, functions of re reactive power in terms of voltage, but this guy uh, rigorously can only be a constant P. Now that's, there are um, ad hoc, well let's say ad hoc, somewhat heuristic techniques for including some voltage dependence, but theoretically it stands as an unsolved uh, problem. So I skip over the next point. The ultimately Arpanov function was obtained in, uh, from my point of view, was obtained in Ian's thesis. And when I came to Russia, we we're very proud of this because it, it covers a lot of things. And when I came to Russia, I discovered that a guy called Vasin here in St. Petersburg had a, a, a more elementary version, but still he, he got most of the problem. And it was published in a, a journal I'd never heard of, the St. Sitz of Petersburg Journal. He took a first integral approach and had that resolved about 10 years before um, we got the network-based um, uh, network models version. I mean, this had some advantages, but this certainly was a, a sleeper for us. So nobody knew about it. Nobody knew about it. And I've been telling people since. So. Um, okay, so there's more unsolved things. It turns out that with these Lyapunov functions with a network preserving model, um, what, what we've been trying to do and making slow progress is that's, uh, evaluating those Lyapunov functions can be a nightmare. But if we could, if any of you know about the classical equal area criterion, what we would like to do is convert these Lyapunov function techniques for network preserving models into stability statements involving, say, cut sets on graphs or conditions on cut sets on graphs, trees, all that kind of thing. And recently I've got a, a good student who's going back to some of those um, problems. Okay, so always, but for those of you embarking on this, the low hanging fruit has been picked and the problems left are a bit hard. Um, a nice thing about Ian's uh, results in his thesis was that these energy functions, because it's differential algebraic equations and you've got impasse points, you actually got, for different solutions of the algebraic equations, you've got sheets of energy. So we have this kind of energy surface around the different equilibrium points 
you've got a different energy function. And that's really quite nice and hasn't really been fully followed, uh, followed up. So those multiple solutions, far from being mathematical oddities, um, actually can explain a lot about power system behaviour. Okay, now I come to, to um, voltage stability. And um, here the connection with Russia is really quite nice. Um, this guy, this guy Venikov in, um, in Moscow, when I was a postdoc in Berkeley, I, one of the things I loved about Berkeley was the bookshops. They were fabulous all over the place. So, and I'm, I'm just passing my eyes along a shelf one day and I see this book on stability, power systems. And it's a yellow book. And I pay two dollars, and I have never had such good value for money in a book. This book was basically a summary of Venikov's and analysis of power grids, and it was uh, quite a revelation. And I never met Venikov, of course, but I did meet Stroyev, his student. And I remember sitting with Stroyev every morning for about three mornings in a row in his apartment, because if I went to the department, he was to swarm with people. So he said, David, let's meet at home, we'll have a cup of tea. And we basically went through, I basically ran past him all the things I knew that were of an analytical kind in the West. And it was like, yes, we know that. Yes, we know that. Yeah. Mm, that one, not quite, but yeah, we did have some work related. This was the discussion. It was quite uh, fascinating. But anyway, in, in this book, there was voltage stability analysis of a kind I hadn't seen. And so we, um, we, we of course, uh, went to town trying to build on that. But in voltage stability, it's more complicated because there are these static concepts, what's well, more diverse. You've got to keep voltages within a band. And uh, typically, people like voltage sensitivities as a measure of how close you are to some kind of problem. But, um, and so with our models, we were able to sort of set up a, an analysis which involved basically you have a power flow, you have a load characteristic, which is nonlinear, as I described before, and then you have the system capability characteristic, and you've got to keep the power levels right. So there's a whole lot of sensitivity calculations and um, using the power flow Jacobian, which I'm going to have to just mention in passing. But the, the Russians had very nice ways of looking at the proximity to the collapse in terms of um, sensitivities in the power flow. And that's called the, it, it is known in the West as the Venikov criterion. Just trust me that it's a, it's a power flow, a special power flow Jacobian, which really tells you how close you are to that collapse uh, point. But it's a static concept. What we did was um, come back to this thought, I don't like this as a static concept. This is, this is dynamic, so come on, let's, let's do that. So we formulated con dynamic concept. Since we had a dynamic load model, it was easy to then think about dynamic um, concepts of voltage stability. And these definitions were ultimately accepted as standard by IEEE after a lot of argument with people who insisted that it was still a static concept. Um, but anyway, roughly speaking, we could have an agenda like angle stability. There were equilibria, some of them were stable, some of them were unstable, and um, you know, small disturbance, large disturbance, that, that could all be analysed. Lyapunov functions were quite hard to get, but you could do a lot anyway because of the particular dynamics. Um, I'm just going to say, without going through the details, one of the, the nicest things that I liked in all this is that we were able to get a dynamic version of the Venikov criteria. Um, Venikov was this special Jacobian in terms of static load characteristics and power flow. In our load model, we had two characteristics a static load characteristic and a transient characteristic. And it's very easy to justify with the physics. If you think, if anyone knows about what an induction machine is, if you hit an induction machine with a voltage step, 
In the first instance, it's just an impedance because the slip can't move. It's just an impedance. So that's the transient characteristic. In the steady state, the slip can move and you get a more constant power characteristic. So we absorbed those, that idea into general generic load models and we got, um, uh, this is, I, I can't go through the details, but a certain Jacobians are non-singular. This is the single, single bus version. At an equilibrium point, you get small disturbance stability if the transient Jacobian and the static Jacobian modified by some multiplier have the same sign. The point is that there was a precise, rigorous, dynamic result which included the Vannikov criterion as its static version. All right, I'll skip over that. Um, by that time, Yuri Makarov from St. Petersburg had come to Newcastle and then Sydney and he worked with Ian and myself and students and we did a lot of things. Um, generalised Vennikov type stability criterion for static and dynamic models of the general networks, stability analysis of particular classes, existence of oscillations, robustness, distance to collapse, a lot of this stuff built on known Russian work which was not known in, in the West. But I always live with the knowledge that someday somebody will come up to me and say, hang on, oh, we did that in Russia, you know, 20 years ago. <laughs> I don't know. But, but I don't think so, because this was all based on those um, dynamic uh, models. All right. Of course, we weren't the only people studying power system science. So people, at, my colleagues at Berkeley, the, the students who came after with Praveen Raya, Felix Wu, they got very involved in um, chaos theory. They, they had this, uh, this Berkeley example of trip generators and a special load and some transfer conductances and you could really go to town with chaos theory just in that simple example. The idea being if you can get chaos in such a simple system as this, how bad could it get in a large power grid? Um, there are several papers along that line. Okay, um, timing is running out, so I'll just point out a few highlights in the rest of the slides. We have this model that I said we used as a trick to get a rigorously Arfanov function has actually caught on these days with a whole lot of people because I guess they see it as nice and simple and it has enough of the features like uh, network preserving and you can now include renewable power and so on. And, but that's caused me to go back and look at this model as a way of um, trying to get a handle on that problem that I mentioned of relating system stability much more to graph type conditions. I, I no longer like, uh, I, I remember hearing, I think Professor Brocker said years ago that you put up x dot equals ax plus bu and kind of wiped it as the the model to be using for physical systems, something like that. And I, I, I like that idea. I think the right models these days in many systems are network models. That are a graph with bits of dynamics hanging off them. And in that spirit, we would like to get stability conditions in terms of things like Laplacians or special Laplacians. What's nice in network theory is you you, your stability results are all of an interaction between coupling strengths, graph structure, and the system dynamics. And, and that spirit, I think, should be much stronger in the power network community, okay? Um, so, a list of research questions. This uh, rigorously up and off functions for general voltage-dependent load power. Load powers, if someone can solve that before I retire, that'll be great. Um, Graph-based stability criteria, conditions on cut sets. Um, extensions to linking synchronism to structure. There's a lot that can be said there because most of the network science is based on models with identical nodes and power systems don't have identical nodes. So there needs to be work on non-identical nodes and synchronism, which some has happened more recently. Um, there's, there's all kinds of other ideas like finding the vulnerable points in a network. Instead of analysing a network after a fault happens, kind of know in advance where the vulnerable points are. And, and that's another topic that people are thinking about lately. 
I, 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 just to show you that this all interacts with practical questions. So one practical question that we're dealing with in a project in Australia is because Australia is a great big, it's 4,000 kilometres from the top one end of its grid to the other, it's prone to oscillations. So now en practical engineers just, you know, get their favourite grid, put some solar somewhere and analyse voltage stability. And they do this sort of over and over again. But we asked the question, well, what if most of the solar was in the north? What if most of the wind was in the south and there was conventional power in the middle? Actually, there should be four of these things. But, um, or in Europe, uh, I, I talked to colleagues who were concerned about where the wind, most of the wind is. So you, I can't go and apply any theorem to this problem, but I claim thinking theoretically helps me think about these problems. So, that's the justification, even in power grids, for having some theory, because if we can analyze clusters of solar, like even with my very simple model, if we can analyze systems of certain structure and get some, some general guidelines, maybe that can help us then go to grids like the Australian grid and get some, um, some good uh, directions. Okay, I'm just going to skip quickly over some, uh, some, some examples of network science coming from other directions. This recent paper in Nature by physicists, including quite famous guys, have um, looked at the small signal stability of a power grid. They have used the network reduction model and they've used the network uh, preserving model. And they did... Um, Simple eigenvalue analysis, the simplest type, and drew up graphs of stability and pretty pictures as you get in nature. This is the uh, non-reduced network, that's the reduced network, which if you don't know is an all-to-all -all graph, and, uh, and made a lot of statements about how power grids could be improved. The interesting thing is that I bet serious money that if that paper had been sent to the IEEE power transaction, it would have been rejected. Um, simply because the model is too simple. And, and, and the analysis was very simple, basic eigenvalue analysis. But yet they get a paper in nature, and, and I don't begrudge them that, but it's just an indication of the kind of lack of cohesion of the, of the, of the subject, in a way. Um, okay, uh, Dorfler Chertkov is not only Russian, but he's... Um, a physicist and Bolo have used our simple model and they, they like to relate um, behaviour of power grids to synchronism and in particular to Kuramoto models. Um, this looks a bit like a Kuramoto model, which is popular in biology, and um, they do things to try and deal with the second order <laughs> equation and they've got a what I regard as a Hypothesis. It's, there's no proof for this. But in the style of network science, physics, um, they basically proposed this criteria in terms of the network Laplacian and system angles, did heaps of examples and found that it works 95% of the time and hence it stands as a synchronization condition. Uh, I would like to see this either proved or disproved. Um, and that would be an interesting research project. But as it stands, it's a um, conjecture. Okay, now, not much time to talk about control and smart grids. Uh, smart grids, as I said, I don't like the term unless you allow me to make a, a proper definition in terms of optimality, robustness, adaptive, you know, observability of the grid. I, I believe it's possible to make a good definition of smart grids. Most of what people describe as smart grids is very unscientific. Um, but that's another story. Um, the popular idea that's coming into the control of power grids lately is consensus. Um, we think of, remember that framework that I presented, the one from uh, the US? Uh, I think it's Pula, Kagonica, Felix Wu, a bunch of people that probably as many of you know. Um, see the power grid as having a core, core structure and then these clusters that interact with each other. 
the clusters might be virtual power plants, they might be microgrids, they can be different things, some of them are quite independent. Um, but the theoretical idea here, which has really come quite quickly, is, is very naturally is consensus. Um, consensus control. And that's, if I just mention a few examples, and I, I like these examples because I know the people involved and I feel they've made a really serious attempt, um, like in the spirit of our chair, Romeo, um, to really understand the physics of the problem. Okay? I might not agree with everything, but they've, they, they haven't just, you know, hammered, like they call the hammer looking for the nail. They've, they've made a serious attempt to understand the problem, in this case, frequency control. Frequency control is typically handled at three levels, primary, secondary, tertiary, they're dealing with secondary frequency control. They've once again adopted the simple model and they've come up with a controller which involves what you might call an average consensus type term to get kind of local synchrony, local, sorry, frequency synchrony um, uh, with a special architecture. Basically, you know the frequency of the neighbouring buses. And then uh, frequency control must have no steady state error, so they've got integral control in there, and they get a distributed version, quite a nice result, and I think it's appeared in the transactions now, 2014. Um, this uh, young guy I met in Zurich with your own, my old colleague in Baltusville, the Euron Anderson. Uh, the next one, appeared recently in the control transactions is from Stephen Lowe's group in Caltech. Once again, um, I've sat and talked with Steve quite a lot and I just get, he's one of those guys who really wants to understand, you know, that complicated big machine. He's really made quite a, a good attempt in his group to get to, to fully understand the issues. Now he's, once again, he's taken the simplified model. They're all using linear models which I think we need to improve. But they're using linear models. This is just this is the power flow differentiated, so you get frequencies and set of angles. He's formulated the problem as an optimal control problem where we're using demand response. Demand response means that the loads are not fixed. They're part of the control loop. And he's formulated an optimal control problem which uh, minimizes the disutility to customers. In other words, this is how to get control with another version of minimal effort because upsetting, changing the Ds here changes the customer's power and you'll have to pay for that in some way. So he's got a, a nice optimal control framework and um, to, uh, to do um, primary frequency control and decentralized. Okay, I'll skip over the theorem, but it, 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 it's a quite theoretical statement. Uh, there's um, things about it. It's uh, yeah, load side primary frequency control. It's decentralized. There's no. He doesn't deal with the offset in the frequency, which is important. So I think they're working on that now, and um, and mainly the paper studies the optimal uh, control problem. And I better finish very quickly. Um, there's a lot of control, I just mentioned these, there's a lot of control challenges. I think as soon as we get renewable power in the problem, treating it as a linear problem is not going to work. So it becomes a nonlinear control problem. All of these distributed control problems become nonlinear, that's more difficult. I haven't seen anything about the coordinated voltage control problem, but once again with renewable power, um, we are not, and this is a nice recent work from Ian Hiskin's group, They've shown that with renewable power, um, if you try and hold the voltages down too hard in one place, you just get hyper control activity elsewhere in the grid. So it, it's got to be a coordinated control problem, which I really like because we wrote lots of papers on coordinated voltage control years ago, and maybe now somebody will read them. Um, and so that's another area. Demand side control is very undercooked. And I don't like this assumption that we just make the communications graph the same as the power graph because, in my view, the power graph already gives you some information. So we should be using the communications graph to complement that. 
So there's a question of architecture, which I think we can then start talking about smart grids if we start addressing questions like that. Um, okay, I'm gonna, yeah, the, the last bit was just a result by a student recently. Well, all we did there was pick up on Steve Lowe's idea of disutility, but we formulated it as a switch control problem where you use the demand response very quickly to help you through the first transient. It's a hybrid control solution to the problem. Okay, sorry for the timing. I probably don't have to. Stability. And when I went to continue my, my studies, I went to, to talk with Roberto Canales, which is a former student of Roger Brockett. And he said, I, I wanted to go to the Soviet Union, and he said, you should go to the group of Benikov, because everybody knew Benikov at the time. And then I was naive enough to think that Benikov was going to accept me. And at that time, Soviet Union had the closed institutions, so this institute turned out to be closed, it was only for foreigners. So I ended up here in Leningrad. So <laughs> that's why my power systems career ended up because they couldn't get into medical school. <laughs> well, and there was a good school here too. There was a, there, once again, it was Moscow versus St. Petersburg. Yeah. But the St. Petersburg group, uh, there was this guy named Rushchev. Mm -hmm. uh, he, I met him briefly. He was quite, I think he'd just been in a car accident or something. They had these amazing, robust control algorithms to tune all the stabilizers without much computing power, but they could tune all the stabilizers in, in Russia. Five parameters per, and they did robustly, meaning allowing for continuous. Nothing like that was being used. In, uh, so power systems was okay here too. <laughs> <laughs> well, they ended up in Louis' group, so it was okay. <laughs>